Hello, folks. Um, welcome to the final part of our uh, diversity, inclusion, and sport discussion series that we've been hosting through Kids Sport Edmonton and Calgary over the last many months together. So, so grateful to have you here. And uh, I want to begin uh, by thanking the Calgary Flames Foundation for their incredible support of this discussion series. They've been our uh, partner along the way in uh, providing funding support so that we could host this. Um, and we started back early last spring and uh, have taken this journey together since March and just so grateful for uh, the Calgary Flames Foundation support. So welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion in Sport Discussion Series. Um, it is hosted by Kids Sport, really with the intention that we bring the community together, support um, our kids in our clubs to have the best opportunity possible in sport and physical activity, and uh, really to help elevate the understanding of the diverse backgrounds and experiences of where kids in our sports system come from. So we are, uh, as I said, we've been on a bit of a journey and uh, this session is the last in this series. And today we're gonna be talking about accessibility in sports, um, particularly with a disability lens and uh, super grateful for the panelists that are joining us today. And uh, we are going to uh, journey through a great discussion with them. I want to begin by acknowledging the territories that I'm coming to you from today, and those are of the Coast Salish peoples here in Victoria and home of the Wasanic, uh, Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And um, just yesterday I was with a, an elder in Coast Salish territory who's actually not from Coast Salish territory, but just uh, having some lovely opportunity to hear from him and to navigate um, opening a beautiful sharing circle. And I always am so grateful for those opportunities to learn from our elders and to connect with each other and to really hear from each other. And um, I think that's one of the pieces I value most about the work I get to do is getting to meet such incredible people and hear your stories and journeys as we go together. So um, I'm going to uh, jump in and introduce our speakers today. My name is Andrea Carey. I'm your moderator today. I run a company called Inclusion Incorporated and have been so grateful to be in partnership with Kids Sport um, over the last many months to bring this to life. So our first speaker today that I'm going to introduce is Karen Domit. And uh, Karen's journey in creating accessible and disability inclusive sports spaces and program started in Red Deer, where she worked as a manager of athlete services for the 2019 Canada Games. Can, uh, Canada Games, for those of you that are not familiar with them, are Canada's only national multi-sport event that brings together non-disabled sport, para-sport, and Special Olympics into one event. Following the Games, Karen joined the team, well, she was the team and had a couple other folks working with her at the, uh, as the director of the Calgary Adapted Sport Hub, powered by Jumpstart. And um, we had lots of opportunities to work together as she was in that role, which was super fun. And that is a collective of organizations across Calgary looking to bring more inclusive and accessible play opportunities to kids in the Calgary region. And um, now she has just shifted roles very recently to another games opportunity as the general manager of the 2024 Special Olympics Canada Winter Games in Calgary, which will happen in February, March of 2024. So welcome, Karen. So great to have you here. All right, our second speaker is Dean Zovka and Dean um, has been behind the scenes with us all along this journey because uh, he's part of the team at Connection which is the host um, on Remo, the platform that we're on. So they've he's been uh, back of house all this time and now gets to join us front of house. So welcome Dean. Dean has always had a passion for sport and recreation and spent much of his 20s coaching Calgary's AA and AAA hockey system. After being introduced to the world of autism in the late 90s, Dean focused his passion for sport and recreation on his new community. In 20, 2004, Dean and a small group of parents founded the Autism Asperger's Friendship Society of Calgary, an organization that is driven to build community, provide acceptance, develop relationships, and provide life experience. Over the last five years, 
The Autism Asperger's Friendship Society has provided a wide array of sport programs for their members. And if there's a sport that you, they haven't done yet, they haven't been asked there. They just jump in and make it all happen. Dean is also a public speaker, coach, fundraiser, program developer, friendship maker, and advocate for those who fall outside what most accept as the norm. Um, he's proud to sit on the advisory committee for the Calgary Adapted Hub as well. So welcome, Dean. So great to have you front of house with us on stage. And our third panelist, certainly uh, not, the, um, not in any particular order today, is Ross Wilson. And uh, Ross and I have known each other for a long time through the Paralympic Committee. And um, Ross is uh, a track, road, and gravel paracyclist and recreational para-athlete, triathlete, sorry. Um, from 2014 to 2021, Ross represented Canada in the men's C1 division, making his international debut in 2014 with a third place at the UCI World Cup in Spain. He then uh, continued his journey through uh, many, many medals and accolades um, during the uh, representing Canada on the Paralympic Committee um, in Team Canada, sorry. He's also served as the Vice Chair on the Athletes Council of Cycling Canada, the Vice Chair of the Athletes Council on the Canadian Paralympic Committee, and on the Paralympic Foundation of Canada's um, uh, board, as well as the Audit Committee of the Canadian Paralympic Committee gives a lot back, Ross does, including raising over $75,000 in 2020 for the Paralympic Foundation of Canada. Uh, he's also in his day job, a chartered professional accountant, um, a certified fraud examiner and holds a master's of business administration and uh, works on internal audit services within the public sector. So welcome Ross. So welcome to all three of you. It's so lovely to have you here. And uh, I so appreciate being in relationship with each of you and uh, really excited for you to share all of your experiences with our audience today. So we're gonna kick off um, by just inviting you each to share a little bit more about um, uh, any additions to your bio or uh, your experience that you want the audience to know a little bit more about. And then really thinking about um, what is, creating um what does creating sport programming really mean to you and accessible sport programming what should that be and so ross i'm going to kick off with you sure thanks very much andrea um i guess at a, a high level not really too much to add to my bio i mean it's uh, nothing too exciting I'm, I'm happy to be part of this and speaking about sport in general when we talk about kind of that that question about creating accessible sport in general though i think um, to me, it's really that question of what do we do where we, we change the lens about who is the sport actually intended for? I think for, for too long, we've kind of approached it with this this uh, this view that we, we create sport, which is modeled after the sport itself. And those who have particular interest will, will flock to it and, and be attracted to it. And I think it's more we need to start having conversations and, and views towards how do we change the lens so that it's not about this is the sport, take it or leave it, but more about this is the sport and how do we invite everybody to be part of it and to come to the table. All right, what a lovely way to start us off. Karen, let's go to you next. Yeah, I'll build off of those comments, Ross, that, um, you know, in thinking about this question, I think we often land on this theme where we wrestle between um, should sport be inclusive or should it be adapted specific for persons with disabilities? And I don't think that there is a right answer there. I think, as everything is, it's an individualized approach, right? That um, there both can be true, both options can exist. But I think the real power of inclusive sport is that it addresses so many of our sports system inequalities out there. Um, that having inclusive sport opportunities invites not just an individual with a disability who feels like the traditional sports system isn't the place of their belonging or that they can't meaningfully participate up until a certain point when then they're othered um, by the time they hit like age 10. Uh, it can also then address those individuals who entered sport in early specialization. Um, so if you're a child who chose to play 
baseball or soccer and then by age 12 you decided you wanted to get into hockey right now our sports system is not designed for you to enter hockey at age 12 you have to decide as a seven-year-old and what human should be punished for that decision as a seven-year-old um so i think just we need to be intentional about creating opportunities for participation that are more broad that are more inclusive um because yeah, there's just, there's so many people that fall in that gray zone that you don't have to be on a high performance pathway and fit into the league structure just to have a place to play. Um, the same can be said for a child with autism too, right? Once they get to a point of feeling like they don't socially belong with their peers on that sports specific team, um, they feel like they fall in the gray zone and then adapted specific sport may not be the right place for them. So when we think about adapted basketball, What we typically only have then is wheelchair basketball. If you are a child with autism, that likely doesn't fit your needs. So where do you go? So we need to just be more creative and open about what those opportunities look like. All right. Thanks, Karen. Dean, what about you? Uh, For me, I think when it comes down to sport, it's almost similar to removing the sport and it, it becomes about opportunity. I think the more opportunity for every kid, age, ability, um, disability so i think building out the the, the opportunities for everybody and, and like i think carrie mentions and talks about that early that point where you can enter at any age you can enter at any ability there's an entrance point for you um i think you, you look at the job the, the groups like special though and the autism aspirants especially the society have done of providing the breadth of sport for new different community, new communities i think that for me you, yeah i think about sport i think growing up i learned how to skate and shoot a puck and run and throw a discus and stuff but I, it's also where i learned my leadership skills my my ability to work with team be on a team my ability to understand there's going to be outsiders sometimes that don't quite fit the, in, into the team no matter what team you're on um and all kids need those skills and i think sport is such a good place to develop and learn those skills and even how many of us Karen mentioned the word belong there um grew up somewhere didn't really belong and then you walked into a a gymnasium or into a bike track or into a skateboard park uh, and all of a sudden there's hey look i belong here um, and so i think those things that sport brings we just have to get those those out to as many kids and adults as possible um, and i think that's just sport is opportunity to entrance into all those uh, all those life development tools mm. yeah such a such a powerful point and uh, a piece that I think sometimes gets lost in us trying to make sure we tick all the boxes and run all the logistics. And it's like, how do we, how do we really support the whole person through sport? Because uh, to uh, quote Nelson Mandela, power has the sport to change the world, but uh, it also has the power to do a lot of harm. And so, how do we use it for good? Um, so, thinking about sort of what um, sport does and doesn't do, what are some of the barriers that sport maybe puts up without even really knowing it? And uh, Karen, you've, you've just uh, pivoted jobs where you were really digging into this. So maybe we'll lead off with you. Yeah, sure. I'd say, you know, what, what draws me to the games model um, is that it's a large scale event that is the vehicle for influencing inclusion in everything that we do. Um, It's also a promise to the participant that here is an avenue for your high level participation, your high level sport, your everything you've trained for, here's an environment where we are making a promise that we are actively removing all the barriers or as many as possible and addressing and acknowledging those barriers in our plans, in our procedures, in our protocols, in everything that we're doing so that you can participate to your fullest ability, that we are addressing these barriers that you face in the day to day, and we are doing our best to remove them so that your experience is one of the best of your entire life, that this will be a life shaping shaping moment because we did our job as the administrators and the planners to ensure that you can achieve this at your highest level. And that is a life-shaping experience. Um, I think where we get it wrong um, lots of times in this model is that um, to deliver a games is really, you have a huge scope. It's super, super broad. You think of there's endless things that can go wrong that you have to do, that you have to think through. And I think where we get it wrong sometimes uh, or 
when we get it wrong is that we've missed the little things um, in the logistics that are going to have the big impacts. And personally, as a non-disabled person, I don't have that lens all the time, right? I've had enough experiences over the last several years to ha probably have a, a better lens and scope than the average person, non-disabled person does. Um, but I still will not hit everything. So on my leadership team in our planning, absolutely, I have to have voices of persons with disabilities a part of those conversations and making those big decisions because I know I'm a super skilled administrator. I know I'm good at this stuff. I know I'm good at uh, planning the logistics of the games, but as good as I am, I don't have that lens and I will miss things that will be microaggressions that will compound because they have entered this space. These participants have entered this space with the promise that this will be a life-shaping moment and that we will remove and address all their barriers. So if we don't include their voices at the table, we're gonna make mistakes and that's gonna have a compounding impact to their experience. Mm. Bit, of a, bit of a daunting task, but such an important one when we talk about belonging and that opportunity. Dean, let's uh, let's have you build on that because I know you've uh, been navigating this through the work that you do on a daily basis as well. Well, it's, um, it's what I was thinking about a lot of youth we work with in, in, in the autism sector. Um, they they may, may not have like the, the visual um, or all, all the time visual disability. So getting to get, getting involved in sport can be a daunting task with the, if somebody in this, in, in this series, uh, back said, you know, all, all policy and processes run from a place of privilege and as Carrie touched on not ha not having folks who your, all your decisions and paperwork are affecting involved in the decision and the building of it. Um, so yeah, you know, we highly agree the idea that include folks that are, are near difference to, uh, on your decision-making on your, on your registration form processes, check with families, um, we, groups like kids sport. I mean, one of the barriers for a lot of families out there is financial. Um, and I know kids sport can be, they can look down to the individual needs of that child and not necessarily just base it on, on a overarching theme of, um, tra tradition, what traditionally maybe looked at in, in terms of financial need. A, a lot of our families, um, face, they may, they may make enough money from the outside, but having one, two, three kids with, uh, with a disability adds to your to your finan the financial stress of the family and every time you fill up registration forms um you have to disclose or not disclose and include the medical papers and then likely talk to somebody about supports needed and it's nice to have safe programs like AFS and special olympics and those things but a lot of the goal for our, a lot of our athletes is to get introduced to the game of lacrosse or boxing passion whether or not but decide have an avenue to get involved in other sport um, so i think include individuals include organizations um, i know we're always happy scott's here to be involved with any people wrestling decisions with process or policy to to bend or not bend but um yeah i think including voices at the table as often as possible in all avenues especially in key decision making um is important and as carrie mentioned it may be a microaggression, but again we know we know how those can build up and the, and, and the effects that those can have on folks to sort of discount what might be micro to me um, and how that might come off, come off to, to somebody else. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and we often talk about, well, we call them microaggressions, they're aggressions, and we need to acknowledge that uh, they're felt that way. And the compounding effect can is often quite macro. Um, Ross, you've often been that voice, <laughs> so I'm gonna come to you next. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really interesting. Dean mentions kind of financial barriers, and I, I would cl classify that as like a barrier to entry of the sport. But I think um, for, for myself, when I look at sport in Canada, and I think of my my own uh, participation, and I think of my friends who who often they have a physical disability, um, it really boils down to the notion of parity of esteem or parity. Uh, so when I think of events and opportunities, uh, it, you take myself for example I, I joined cycling as an as an adult um, and the opportunity for me to compete was national championships that is the paracycling race in Canada so if we think of like a barrier to entry imagine your your child's first experience is national championships and then their next opportunity beyond national championships is international competition and so then you're kind of like okay so there's a huge barrier there and then when we start talking about parity of esteem, I think back to even my national championships and I was at the most prestigious race from for my sport in Canada and I was racing at 8 a.m. in front of a crowd of zero 
and I had my medal ceremony at 10:30 uh, a.m. in a in front of a crowd of um, I think one parent who had shown up to watch their their child compete. And when I talked to other people at uh, in Parasport across Canada, that's not a unique um, experience. It, it's very common. You see that um, like the the Parasport or the para athletes they're competing at these odd times, and it's like. It could be their gold medal event and they're doing it at 8 a.m. while the qualifier for the men's elite is at 4 p.m. There's no media coverage and so there's no parody in terms of uh, just the celebration of that of that individual. Uh, then we, we kind of get into that that horrible notion of prizing and you start to see even in the prizing, it's it's not even just the, the gender imbalance, but um, in, in parasport as well, there is that kind of prizing di differentiation where I, I mean, I've never received a prize check in my life, and, and yet I've been internet, I've been a world champion, I've set world records, um, and then I have a friend who is a, you know, in men's elite category, and he makes a living full time off of his his prize winnings, uh, and then finally we talk about even just how our organizations celebrate the achievements of uh, those who are competing in parasport. Um, and I think back to my own experience, I set a world record uh, within the same year, uh, another cyclist within the, the elite women's category had set a world record. Uh, there was, I think, a huge advertising campaign aligned around the, the female world record, which fantastic, we need to promote women's sport, I absolutely don't disagree. Um, but there was, I think, a 50 word article written about my world record. Um, within the, the Cycling Canada national team a world records website, her record has been updated and mine sat, uh, sat unupdated for years. It just wasn't even reflected. And so when I think back to that kind of those experiences, that notion that this achievement is good for you really resonates. And you hear that very often as a para-athlete. And that really just, it, it, it devalues the achievement. Either it was a, a great achievement or it wasn't a great achievement kind of thing, but to say, this is so good for you, it, it marginalizes that. And so from that period of period of steam perspective, I mean, when you don't feel like whatever you achieve is, is of value to anybody, it makes it very hard to, to make you want to participate. And then we say, well, there isn't enough participants to, to, to make it of worthwhile to have this competition. And so then there isn't even a competition. And so it's just, it's this vicious cycle, but it really resonates from that, that parody. Mm. And given that the root of uh, Paralympics is around para and parallel and parody, that's uh, a extremely astute observation and one that uh, hopefully the leaders that are on this call can reflect upon in terms of how do we create that parody? How do we create that parallel experience so that everyone in sport is having the same or similar experience in a way that works for them, obviously? So I want to go to thinking about sort of how do we structurally set up sport for athletes with a disability and that will like really kind of move us to true inclusion. Um, what are some of those barriers to that change that we're actually seeking? And um, Dean, maybe we'll kick off with you this time. Well, I think to speak to sport organizations and, and to reach out if you have questions i think to remove that i think there's just a lot of fear i know even with our, our sport programming um some of the internal ones there's been groups that as we start to work with them there's so much paranoia around working with us that um they won't have staff or coaches sign up they may be fearful they've never done it before typically that turns around to their staff and coaches fighting over who gets to work with our group and who gets to coach us um and that that fear can be a big thing if you don't not introduce, don't introduce yourself to it um and, we, and we've all been there fearful of things that we know are like, oh, wow, that was, uh, and I think don't be afraid to do something different. Um, I know uh, we have uh, youth for years that could never really play in a hockey team, but he found that his community team allowed him to sort of come out at a, on a limited basis and be a part of the team. Maybe he didn't play all the games, maybe he didn't quite, but it, 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 it was inclusion and accept, acceptable for him to be, do that and, and made him feel well. It wasn't that... Uh, and it wasn't a high competitive thing, but just the, him being involved, that was good enough for him, his family. And it took his coaches and um, the group around him to say, well, how can we make this work? He just wants to play hockey. He's not worried about ice time. He's not worried about scoring. He just wants to be on a team. Um, and it was huge for him. Just to so make that one small accommodation to say, okay, well, we can make this work just so somebody can play. Um, 
So that I think that that removing that fear from organizations is, and also Ross talks about the visibility. Um, you know, we try to do a better story. Of, we always want to do a better story of telling our stories of um, all our boxing and MMA and lacrosse and these cool things we're doing because we want people to know what we're doing, but we also want a 10 year old with autism somewhere to say, oh, I could play lacrosse one day. Um, oh, I can do this one day. I think that visibility um, is the way to get more athletes in a bigger scope of focus. And I think that um, it's important to be sure that the folks that are out there that are successful and are doing things to really let people know that and get, get that visibility so, so kids out there can see, and it's, it's huge in, the, in a lot of the sector that um, the visibility of people seeing people like them taking part, succeeding, being celebrated, that inspires kids at that to get involved and, and know that they could, but they could do that one day too. Not to have to Google a specialty to find an article, that one article should be up there so everybody can see that. Yeah, thanks for that. So many pieces to pick up on there. Um, I'm going to pick up just on the fear piece to bridge us a little bit um, and just share a little bit of an experience because when I first got involved in para sport and disability um, sport, we were uh, running a sport facility here in Victoria, a kind of custom built Canada's first summer sport institute. And um, we recognized that we needed to build more inclusive programming and our team was quite fearful at the beginning. And we had a number of discussions and brought in a number of folks with lived experiences to talk through that and just to really realize that the piece that kind of really resonated at the end of the day was thinking about how every single participant that shows up in our programs is extremely different in a variety of ways. And at that point, we had lots of folks taking part in like fitness related programs who some of them had not moved off the couch in years and some were, you know, really skilled and uh, fit athletes. And it was like, you're planning for each of those people every day. This is no different. It's just figuring out sort of what's going to work for them and how you best support them. Same as all your other clients. And that was a bit of a pivotal point for our team in terms of recognizing and appreciating that we all show up differently every single day. And how do we learn about that, celebrate that, support that? So Ross, I'm going to go to you um, to build on that piece. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrea. I, I mean, I think those are wonderful stories and it's it's awesome. I think the kind of the critical piece that I take away from Dean's story and even your story is that you had an organization that reached out to other groups with specialized knowledge. Um, and so when I think about building better sports systems or different sports systems structurally, uh, the thing that jumps to my mind is we shouldn't have to reach out. We should be purposeful about who we're recruiting, how we're structuring the governance of the, the organization. Um, like I, I'll be very blunt and, and matter of fact, I'm a big fan of affirmative action. I think it makes sense that within your, your, your board structure, you should be very clear and intentional to say, we will have people with a disability included within our board. We will have female representation. We will have minority representation. And I recognize that at the community level and the grassroots level that there's challenges in finding those individuals. Um, but I think that for too long, sport has been run by largely volunteers who are recruiting from very similar volunteer pools who bring very similar perspective and very similar knowledge and insights and don't necessarily understand uh, some of the challenges or needs that are associated with disability sport. And so being intentional and actually building up that skill set from that uh, governance perspective and, and how we run the sport itself builds up that bench strength, which translates then to changes in the policies and approaches and changes in how the organization is run to actually drive inclusivity. And so I think it really begins from, from that perspective. I don't think that uh, it's a magic silver bullet and it changes everything overnight, but that's to me kind of the, the missing piece is moving away from doing it the way we've always done it mm, yeah definitely can't keep doing it the way we've always done it um, and i think there's some incredible practices um, and organizations across the country that are actively working on that type of approach or being very intentional about how they build their leadership and kind of the next generation of leaders um, so thank you for that, Ross. That's uh, an incredibly good insight for us to all kind of take away and think about how do we build that into our structure, our governance, our staffing. Karen, to you. Yeah, 
No, Ross, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, just in response to that, like, as I'm, I'm building a team from the ground up right now that as we're going out in the community and actively recruiting our lead volunteers in different positions, you know, you're, your default mechanism is, all right, who's got games experience? Who's been involved with special? Who are those people that have been around the table all the time? And, you know, it's, I think both can be true, right? You still want that experience in those people around the table who have the history and, you know, know the hurdles that you're going to come up against and the most efficient way of doing things and creative solutions. And um, we're not taking away the opportunities from those people. It's bringing more seats at the table though, right? That then we do have an athlete council that we do have an athlete advisory that we have intentional representation of persons with disabilities in those key roles as well that uh it, it's marrying all those skills and expertise and experiences all together that um yeah we're, we're gonna move further faster farther uh all together so um yeah, that was just my, my side tangent in response to your comments. Um, but going back to the root of the question of uh, kind of what, what's our barrier to change in these systems is, yeah, echoing Dean's comments there that um, I think it almost always will boil down to fear. And Andrea, you and I had this conversation, I think probably in my first week on the job with Calgary Adapted Hub is when we're preparing our partners here in Calgary to step into this brave space of creating more inclusive and adaptive programs. Um, how are we addressing people's um, confidence and competence when they're entering this space, right? That um, normalize it a little bit that, yeah, if you don't have experience in this, of course, it's going to be scary and intimidating. And, you know, one of our advisory committee members, Sean Crump has a Ted talk um, that if you haven't watched it, go and watch it because it's incredible. But he talks about how, our societal views of, of course, we are conditioned to be fearful and intimidated and scared of disability that as a young child, when you're walking down the street and you're curious and you have questions and you see something that's different from what you have typically seen in your bubble, if someone within your core family does not have a disability and you see that difference as a child, you're curious, you point and you ask questions and you say things out loud in public. And then what is that response met with? Your parent shushes you. Right. And so that's the conditioning that we come into the world with that when we point and ask questions about disability and we get curious and we want to know more and what it's like for that individual, we're shushed. We're told that's bad. Don't talk about it. Don't look, don't stare, don't point, don't address. So fast forward 20, 30 years, you're entering that workspace being told, hey, you know what? Spotlight, <laughs> look at it now, ask questions, be curious you can't expect people to flip a switch and all of a sudden be comfortable, right? Um, so I think there's a huge piece of that that we have to acknowledge and work with that um, people do need mentorship and, you know, to, to own that there's, it's uncomfortable um, and you're gonna make missteps and um, your best way to do this though is to create strong relationships and allies and mentorships. So like partnering with Dean's group with Autism Asperger Friendship Society like that, that's been the biggest catalyst to change in Calgary for the Calgary Adapted Hub and all those partners. Um, but I think what we often focus on though is the low hanging fruit, right? That we get really excited and get caught up that, well, now something exists where it didn't ever exist before. So now we have this try it program and it's more people are getting exposed and now our organization is doing a little bit versus we never did anything before. And it can be gratifying and easy to pull off, but we can't stop there. So we need to be intentional then about how are we changing the sport partners who are the experts in those activities that we can't continue to just only have multi-sport triad experiences that we have to go further and support those sport leaders and activity specific leaders to create their environments to be more inclusive and invite them in to test out their sport systems to try it on for size and get to that point of feeling comfortable um, so that they can create more inclusive and adaptive programs. And then Dean, back to your other comment too around representation. Um, you know, that's something we're really struggling with uh, with our team as we're getting off the ground here with the Special Olympics Canada Winter Games here in Calgary, that we continue to enter conversations that people don't know what the Special Olympics are. Um, or they're like, oh, okay, so um, 
yeah, in terms of wheelchair accessibility, uh, where we're going to have problems is in here. And, you know, like, is that going to be okay for your athletes? Because th this is the Paralympics, right? So then like the Olympics are coming to Calgary now in 2024. I thought, thought that bid died. What happened here? <laughs> it's a constant education that no, it's, it's rooted in intellectual disabilities. However, yes, we should be talking about built environment accessibility all the time. That is not the primary user group here, but any coach, parent, participant, like anybody can be showing up at any space at any time. So great that you thought of it. But uh, the, the focus here is around intellectual disabilities. So we have to educate the system a whole lot more. And I think we need to also stop glorifying those stories of only the high performance athletes. Because in my previous role with Calgary Adapted Hub, where we would walk parents through program navigation and that individualized experience and pairing them with what opportunities actually exist in the system, because it doesn't just show up if you Google it or the one or two lines doesn't give you all the context you need. Um, you know, if it says open to all abilities, well, what does that mean? If my child's a full-time wheelchair user or my child's nonverbal, those are two very different abilities that we need to have accommodations for. Um, so we need to do a better job of that access to information and not just showcasing and having representation of the high performance athlete who became an amputee that then became a high performance Paralympian two years after their accident. We need to also show that there's recreational opportunities that the child who was born with a disability has opportunities and pathways for participation and that there's special Olympics grassroots programs that you don't have to be a national games athlete or a world games athlete, that there is opportunity across the board. So I took up way too much airtime with that answer, but I think there's so many different angles in addressing this, this structure that we need to talk about. Whew, that was, that was an awesome answer. <laughs> and you didn't take up way too much airtime. That was brilliant. Um, so I wanna kind of stay on that thread and I'm gonna throw a bit of a different question than we had planned for the group and then I'll circle back to our, uh, our planned questions. But I'm just thinking like, from each of your perspective and navigating the, the systems you've each navigated and Karen, you just brought up such a brilliant point, like as a parent trying to figure out like, what do I do for my kid for them to have a good experience? So I kind of want to stay on that and just think about that because I feel like, you know, we've talked a little bit more about structure and like some of the pieces to make programs more accessible or some of the barriers, but like as a parent, what are those things that sport leaders the leaders in this room today should really focus on to support that parent and that family to get into and stay in the sport. So Karen, can I just stay on you and yeah, <laughs> and we'll rotate back through? I was going to jump in no matter what. <laughs> um, I think back to Dean's original point too around like registration systems, right? It's how we're asking the questions in registration processes. It's how we are wording information in our marketing materials on our websites that it needs to come from a place of disability not being othered disability not being a negative like people will take a look at it and at first glance rule out whether they belong or not so asking questions that aren't necessarily just rooted in whether you're trying to figure out if someone has a disability or not they're going to apply to everybody like every child like you said at the facility you used to work at, everybody's coming in with a unique situation. So ask questions like, what type of environment does your child succeed in? Are there any accommodations or delivery mechanisms um, for instruction that your child has benefited in the past? And then list some examples like visual cues, one-on-one, -on -one, drawing on a board, having them write it out. These are things that are gonna apply to everybody and then ask at the bottom of a registration question, an open-ended, like, well, all your questions essentially should be open-ended. You shouldn't be classifying people in boxes, right? Because there's always going to be a gray zone. People are always going to find, not everyone's going to fit in the boxes. But then I think at the very end, you need to be asking parents, is there anything that you want us to know that we have not addressed in this form? Is there anything that is important for us to know about your child's success or feeling of belonging or welcome in this space that we should know as the leaders? Would you like to have a follow-up call with someone from our team? Because again, it's no matter what, 
someone's going to like a parent is going to have an answer to that question, regardless of disability or ability. A child is your like top prize commodity. <laughs> this is the most important thing in your life. The fact that we send our kids off to school to strangers, teachers and sport, like it's crazy. We are putting so much trust. So let's acknowledge and honor that we've got so used to these systems that it's like, yep, just show up, plug and play and we'll figure it out. For a parent of a child with a disability who has been told through all diagnoses and all these things that they don't belong, that these things won't ever happen, for them to just simply trust and hand over their child into a program, it takes so much more trust building that you can't just open up registration to a program because you thought it was a good idea and expect in eight days it's going to fill and it's going to be successful. That's how the cycle continues, that then we don't get enough people in these spots, that then we say it's not worth running because only six kids showed up. And because we didn't do our due diligence to build trust and safe and welcoming belonging spaces, so people thought that they could show up. It takes time. <laughs> well done, my friend. Well done. Okay. Um, Dean, do you want to build on that? Well, I, I think, I, I think, yeah, I can build on it. I'm trying to think where I can build on it. I mean, um, it's the, 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 the idea of the systems and the participant, I think, because there's also the caveat that one of our successes has been that our, we treat our youth like athletes first. Um, and that's important from a, from a, from Haley Wins. And, and every athlete needs some accommodations. The idea that, um, we talk often that any of the accommodations you may make for somebody with a difference, they're going to also, some of those accommodations will also be good for the neurotypical kid or um, the any kid who comes through the door. So when you look at those accommodations, it's not just, well, we have one or two registrants out of 100 that are going to need these accommodations, but you don't know how many other kids are going to benefit from those accommodations and also, again, learn those, learn those skills of accommodation. Um, sorry, my, my, my. Nope, you're good. Yeah, um, something's freezing on my end. Okay, <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of a delay in your camera, but your voice was good. And now you're on mute. <laughs> sorry, well, sorry, go over to Ross. I'm, I'm, something's like this. Okay, all right, let's flip to Ross. It's good to, a good, uh, good little segue. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Karen Karen nailed uh, an awful lot of really great uh, examples. Uh, I, I'm not a parent myself, and so I, I certainly don't necessarily uh, relate to, to a lot of the struggles for parents. But I think back to my own experiences and my friends' experiences in joining sport and joining parasport. Um, and the overwhelming impression that I get from a number of people and myself is that it's, you have to actually fight to be part of this. And it's so that was even for joining paracycling at a national level or as on a paracycling team, you had to fight to even get into the program. It wasn't this, this notion of being welcomed. It was, you had to first prove that you were actually disabled and you had to prove that you were competitive at an international level. And you had to prove that, you know, you would be able to dedicate the time to this effort. It wasn't about like opening and welcoming kind of environments. And I think that um, certainly when you think of, of kids sport, I think that that's very, very common. I mean, we talk about forms and having to disclose all this information. Um, if you think about it from an employment standpoint, if I was applying to a job and they said, what is your, do you have a disability and what is it and how will it affect how we operate? I mean, yeah, I'd love to get a copy of that form because then I could go find a nice lawyer and all of a sudden I wouldn't need a job. But yet when we have kids sport like that, it starts with this, this premise that like, if you have a disability, you're going to tell us what you need. You're going to tell us what accommodations we have to do. Why do we never approach it with this sense that we understand that, you know, 20% of the population has physical disabilities. A huge percent has intellectual disabilities. Um, like a huge number are neurodivergent. Why aren't we starting with the, the, the piece in mind where it's like, we need to build sports systems that are already considering this, that are already embedding that within the structure, already embedding that within the coaching, um, that are creating environments where for those individuals who choose to participate, and it should be that they choose to participate, um, it's already there for them. And, and it's not that they then need to be this voice of uh, explanation about like everything. Like for myself, especially the, the, the number one question that I always get as soon as somebody hears that I have a disability and I'm participating in something, it's like, what do you need me to do? Like, you tell me what your limitations are. You tell me this. Well, 
by the nature of it, I'm participating in sport, which is competition. If I tell you what my weakness is, all I'm doing is just telling you how to beat me. I'm not going to do that. I'm also, you know, prideful. I don't want to ever say this is what I can't do. And I don't think I'm unique. I'd love to say I'm some special flower, but I think that these feelings are very common across the board. And I think even for kids, especially like if you imagine it, you're, you're brought up in a world where everybody looks at you and sees you as being odd. And now you join a sport and you have to now explain to either your coach or parents all these ways about how you are odd. Like that's, that's, a, that's a horrible experience for them. And, and it places this burden on the, on them to, to actually being part of it. Um, the administrative burden for the parents in terms of even getting through the forms is just, it's silly, right? So I think it's, it's really just building the, those sports systems that actually start with the understanding these people exist and are part of our target audience. We're not just targeting able-bodied. So I'm sorry, that's a bit of a rambly answer, but you went off script. So <laughs> I did. Yep. Go off script with me. I love it. We'll be in community on that. <laughs> no, that was a great answer, Ross. Thank you. And, um, uh, you know, I think it it's about the ultimately about the experience and how people feel like they belong in those spaces. And if we plan for different people to be different in every scope of how we're designing sport experiences, because we all are going to be different, but we need to think about intentionally um, naming how we're going to support people, naming who's who is welcome in those spaces. So we're not sort of um, to Karen's earlier point, um, you know, it's like all abilities. It's like, okay, well, what does that mean? And how do I know that that's going to be a safe space and a space that's supportive for me as a person, my child, whomever is registering into that to be part of it. So I just want to sort of open it and see if anyone has any other reflections you want to add before we move on to next question. Dean, you seem um, like your internet's a bit more stable now. So just... yeah, no, I, got, I got frazzled because I, I was missing bits and pieces. Um, okay. Oh, and and then it, 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 it feel like how often it comes back for me back to the communication, connecting with, mm. with or, organizations. And I mean, yes, we all know in the world of disability, there's a there's a breadth breadth of uh, of, of disabilities and, 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 and different abilities, and getting information from everybody and kind of everybody is is hard. But I think in Calgary, we're great. You have groups like the Calgary Adapted Hub. Um, an amazing team over at MRU and, and, and all the three other systems that you, that you can communicate and talk with to be sure you are having to hear, have voices included, pare down some of those processes. Um, and I think it just comes back to the communication with the communities that you're looking to involve. And I think also on us to, and I think we do a good job with Scott to make sure we're going out to communities and not always waiting for them to come to us. Um, I think that's also on the, any disability providers out there in that piece that and Karen did a lot of that door knocking that you can go and knock on doors and say, hey, you know, we're here to offer support if you require in building things. Um, I think that's for me, it comes back to the communication piece with on both sides of being and Karen mentioned being open about, well, do you want us to come in? And again, we'll, our team will do that a lot where we'll go to not just people we're providing programs for, but the student groups and talk about autism and support and talk about our organization and share so that maybe again, we talk about that fear that there's some of that fear removed from at least they have a, a near they, somebody they can come talk to or ask questions of. Um, but I think on both sides, don't be afraid to communicate um, and get out there and, and discuss what's got some hard questions that uh, that come, and that's how we build knowledge and awareness. I'll jump yeah. on too, but I think like you know, obviously we're all coming from this from the perspective of the experience of being the ones to remove the barriers and make the accommodations and you know as a if you're a local sport organization that is you know in a traditionally non-disabled sport and you're taking all this in and like oh yeah well easier said than done like we're an entire volunteer ran organization volunteer board like our pool times are maxed out already or facility times like how do we if all these answers came in with all these lists of accommodations how on earth do we meet this need and i think you know, it's be realistic about what your resources are and your capacity and that you don't have to be all things to all people. Like not every club, not every sport, not every activity will be the right fit for everybody. But we need to be better about building the ecosystem so that we're not just giving people dead ends, that then we need to have those resources like how Autism and Asperger Friendship does, where there needs to be more partnerships and collaborations, where then we can bring in those resources where our organization is lacking, where we have gaps so that we can create an opportunity or experience that can be meaningful. 
or we need to have a network of a system of, I don't think we're going to be a right fit. Let's do a free trial with this parent. Let's find out how do we get to the place that they need to be for their child to participate uh, meaningfully. If we're not going to get there, where else in our network can we send them? What are some other opportunities? What might be a better club, a better fit, a better facility? Um, that yeah, we we need to be more connected and you know what, not to be self-serving in this, but I think that's where you know in a Calgary context, Sport Calgary does a really good job. Calgary Adapted Hub serves a real purpose that I think we we are unique as a city that we are building this system and this ecosystem and really rooted in collaboration that I do think we're we're a model that communities need to be looking at and following and I think you know we're on the ground level of building it but I think I think it's coming. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Karen. I feel like we're kind of leading into some of our wrap up question piece, but just thinking about sort of reflecting on the last couple of answers. So communication has come through really strongly in terms of communicating out about what the program is, um, how you're going to connect and communicate to who is um, you were able to serve in that, how you're able to support them, kind of thinking about those pieces really intentionally. Um, we heard really clearly in your last answer, Karen, uh, around collaboration and that opportunity to work with partners to solve some of these problems together or to create pathways together so that you're not, to your point, creating dead ends for participants. But it's like, you know what, this might not be the best fit for you, but here's where you can go that's going to be able to support you and figuring out what some of those uh, synergies are and uh, connection points. And then the other one that I've heard, which um, I think is important for us to name is relationships, both in terms of relationships with the organizations in our communities and how we're connecting and supporting each other, but also relationships with the families, the participants and the sport organization and taking that time to have that conversation because as Ross named, like the registration process can be really daunting, but like, if they just have a place to call and ask some of those questions, and Karen, I know you served this purpose many, many times during your tenure at the Adaptive Hub, but just thinking about like, how do they have a conversation with someone to even understand like where to start and what is needed and what equipment do they need to consider and how do they register and what are some of those resources available um, or where's the best place for them to go? So those are sort of like, communication, collaboration, relationships are really shining through. So I just wanted to really reiterate that. So let's kind of build on Karen's last answer around sort of what are those, some of those steps forward? And you listed a few really great things in there, Karen. So I'm going to um, maybe go to Dean next to just think about what are some of those um, steps that the clubs can take? So, you know, uh, reach out. So I think the, the idea that what you look and not just, again, not just always from the lens of disability, but how can we, what are some of the barriers to participation and get out and seek the information from the community. And for us, I know it's when we get a call from an organization, hey, we have a, we have a unusual number of kids lost his registered this year. Could you come talk to some of us? Um, you know, we're happy to go up and talk with folks. And I think those first steps becoming, looking at what that, some of those requirements for first entry. Um, so I know I, I, I spoke about sort of my local, uh, for the Brackley Bears Hockey Association, they do a good job of trying to make, make it very accessible so that I know my son's on the U17, but we have some kids that are older, they probably should be playing U9 by age, but they're just brand new, so they're able to play U7, and then, then there's some mixing and matching that happens. Kids from out of territory seem to be pretty flexible to get involved because it's just about, you know, you want a kid to play hockey, it's not about how your level you're at, it's that you want to play. Um, and I think in that, we're make, make, making everything accessible as you can have care talk about triad days. Those are great for, for all, all kids, um, regardless of ability. And I think that just be creative and, um, don't, and I think Ross mentioned a couple of don't always just say, well, this is how it's been done. We, you know, look at your, and again, it's all about look at your bylaws, look at your registration forms, look at the policies, include people in your, um, who, what diverse groups do you have involved in your board and your decision-making and your training. Um, for years, I would go out and do a lot of training. And I think for me, and I know Scott does this now, is, you know, we go out and speak a little bit, but we also include our athletes and our individuals um, to talk about the experience. And that all the time, sport isn't always, the outcome always isn't going to be a gold medal. Um, the outcome might be they left their house once a week for six weeks, and that may be a huge outcome. Um, so I think also we can assume that the outcome, outcomes for success can look like for, 
for all kids and all athletes and have that outcome for success may be different. And there has to be the opportunity for different successes for, for everybody based on what they need. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we had a comment in the chat just around um, financial assistance being such a huge um, asset as well and thinking about the work that kids sport does in um, our communities to support kids participation as well as jumpstart being another key one. Um, and I know many more so I don't I don't want to exclude anyone but those are sort of the two that uh, definitely have been highly investing in that space. So um, Ross, we're going to come to you. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Um, so I'll preface my comments with with a bit of an apology to Karen, because I disagree with one of her last statements, frankly. I don't think that it's appropriate for an organization that takes any sort of form of public funding or any sort of um, public money to be able to say, this isn't a place for you. Now, I think that if you're receiving public funding, it's, it's meant for Canadians, and Canadians include those with a disability, includes those with um, Cognitive impairment includes those who are neurodivergent. And so I think that really when we start talking about the sports organization, what, what can they do? I think they can start to really live the values which they communicate within their mission statements and their, their kind of government structures. Most of these organizations at the grassroots will say that this is about growing the sport. It's not about growing the sport for this select group of individuals. And so if you're really about growing the sport, do everything you can to grow the sport. Don't just do everything you can to grow the sport within your small sector of niche. If you want to grow the sport within that niche, just be transparent and be honest. We are not taking public funding. We are only interested in growing the sport for white males from the suburbs. Okay, like I don't agree with that, but you're at least honest and transparent about it. And you're not telling me that there's opportunities here. And you know what, I'll keep my dollars and I will go someplace else and do it. I do think it's wonderful to communicate that there is other opportunities, but I have to think about that from a perspective of being a participant. If I went to an organization and I said, you know, I really want to be part of this because, you know, you're a great team. I've heard about you in the community. I want to be part of that. And you tell me, well, this isn't really a place for you, but over here they have this special program for people who are just like you. Well, already I'm feeling like, well, I've just been told that I'm not good enough to be part of that. So, I think that it is just live live the real values that you're that you're communicating, um, and yeah, like do what you what you need to do to 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 go as far as you can. I I don't think that inclusion is something where we pick and choose aspects of it. I think we do what we can to be inclusive, and we we do everything we can to be inclusive, or we choose to be not inclusive and we be honest about what we're doing. Uh, but the consequences of that are that we accept that. We are not for everybody and we communicate that clearly and we then don't accept any sort of public funding. But that's uh, my hot take and so I apologize, Karen, I think you're a wonderful person. I'm not trying to, to discredit or be a jerk or anything here, but uh, you know, that's just, yeah, my own two cents. <laughs> no apologies necessary, Ross. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's great insight and feedback around the public funding piece, certainly, right? That. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take that way. I'm going to give that some more thought around uh, how I frame that statement in future because I, I completely agree with your points. And this is why we have a panel of incredible humans sharing different perspectives. It would be boring if we all thought the exact same. <laughs> All right, on that note, um, and I give you each an opportunity if you want to do kind of a last word to our audience to set them up for success. And uh, otherwise, we're going to move to wrap up. Um, so maybe I'll just jump in first here, just because uh, I'm a loud mouth. Um, <laughs> I think uh, if, to set you up for, for success, my, my, my real appeal here would be for a change in mindset. Um, and it's not that the, the notion of that inclusion is something we have to do or it's, it's an, a burden. I think that when we look at this in terms of most of these sports organizations have really noble intentions. Like it's usually rooted in this, this notion of I want to, we want to grow the sport. We want to be part of happiness in the community. We want to be part of fostering a community. We want to be part of development, right? We want to make the world a better place through sport. And so I think 
the, the mindset shift is recognizing that inclusion is a means to an end. This is a way to expand the horizon or expand your, your scope of participants. This is how your, your sport organization can serve more people. This is the broader lens for how you can go about actually fulfilling that, that huge, big, ambitious goal. And it, it, it's about, you know, building that critical mass within the, the, the province itself and then nationally as well. But inclusion is a means to an end to that broader goal. It's not this this burden or this um, horribleness that's thrust upon you. It's this chance to really reimagine how you go about growing your sport. Love it. Okay, Karen. Yeah, I think um, just to offer some really practical examples, and you know, touched on these a lot in lots of my answers around. You know, it's rooted in collaboration when you know you're coming from a place of fear or not knowing where to start. Um, utilize those opportunities. Uh, you know, if assuming that most folks are joining from uh, a Calgary context today, um, connect with Sport Calgary and get involved in. All Sport One Day and All Sport One City, use that as your platform to reach out to diverse populations that you haven't had knocking on your door historically. If you haven't been asked these questions in your organization, that's your red flag that you're not perceived as being inclusive or welcoming because people are not approaching you yet. So that's your red flag to take a look in the mirror and decide what do we need to change in our messaging and our outreach so that people are feeling like they are welcomed and that they belong and utilize try it days and community wide initiatives like the sport Calgary events as your opportunity to try it on for size and to build your advisory committee and welcome those parents and those participants who are going to guide your policies and your processes and your procedures um, and use it then to identify your gaps and your weak spots so then you know who to reach out to uh, to bring you to the place where you need to be to be inclusive and welcoming for all folks. So um, is it Autism Asperger Friendship Society? Is it Special Olympics? Is it Wheelchair Sports Alberta? Um, that will be your, your guiding light and your indicator of where you need to go. Awesome. Thank you. Dean, you get the last word as our host on the oh. here. <laughs> um, I know, I, I think it comes back to me just remembering why, what sport is and where, why people play it. I think obviously there's, you know, there's gold medals at the end of the, the, the rainbow for in the, in the dreams of every athlete. But I think I said, like I mentioned earlier, the, the life skills and the things that we learn as athletes in a dressing room or in a competition, um, winning, losing, supporting, other winners and losers and competitors and all those pieces of it that what sport is about is that participation and that belonging piece and um, it's really to give people experience and that what are you doing not just from a lens of accessibility for the disability community or the difference community but what are you doing for all your athletes and um, what barriers are you putting up for every athlete to uh, to take part and have success and define what their success is I think I know when I coach high level hockey for years and we told all our kids that we're not we're not doing our job if you're not enjoying this. You're not playing beer league hockey when you're 25. Um, you know, we I don't know the percentages of people that go pro and on the gold medals and stuff, but the idea that it's uh, you know sport is about play and activity and exercise and friendships and belonging. Um, and you remember that that's what get kids playing. Is before you're a gold medalist, you got to be a player and you got to be a kid just with a with a bike or a hockey stick or a lacrosse stick or something and. Uh, and that's all we want is more kids that all abilities from everywhere playing sport, taking part in sport and, uh, and having success. So I think that's, we just have to remember that piece and, and reach out to everybody. Mm. Love it. What a great, uh, what a great line to wrap us up today. Thank you, Dean. And a huge thank you to each of our panelists, Karen, Dean and Ross. Um, I really appreciated how you showed up and the perspectives you shared and the fact that you uh, challenged each other to, push a little bit further um, in each of our own practice as well. I think that's one of the pieces around being in relationship and collaboration where we need to support each other and push each other um, because uh, we need to work on being more inclusive across all of our programming and uh, folks with disabilities was our focus today, but thinking about sort of how do we create those system structures and places for each person to belong through sport. So thank you to the panelists. Um, this is uh, our opportunity to wrap up this whole discussion series though. So I just wanna take a moment to um, thank our audience and um, to thank the Calgary Flames Foundation for such an incredible 
um, support of this series of sessions. This is the ninth, and uh, I know earlier in the ch um, earlier in the chat, uh, Kevin posted the link to the past sessions. So we encourage you to go back and listen to those and check them out. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to Kidsport Calgary and Kidsport Edmonton for um, their vision on this and their support in pulling it together. So to Kevin and Dana, thank you. Um, behind the scenes on our team, we had Ryan Gushalak, who is coordinating all of these and uh, supporting us to uh, bring them to life each time. So huge thanks to Ryan and um, to the Connection team, to Dean, Anton, Scott, Owen, um, thank you so much for uh, all the back end support. And Dean, it was super fun to be able to wrap up with you today because uh, your team has just been incredible and it's been really awesome to work with you and um, to get to host this on such a cool platform that I know has a social impact and uh, in the work you do as well. So thank you everyone, take good care and uh, you can jump back out to our table discussions and sit and chat and connect for a little bit.